In this week's Technique Tuesday video, I'll show the relationship between seaming, duplicate stitch, and grafting. As always, if you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, there are direct links down in the description. In addition, as I talk briefly about each of these knitting techniques, you'll see links appear at the top of the screen to videos that go more in depth into these techniques. Those links will be available at any time throughout the video by clicking on the information symbol at the top of the screen. Last week, I demonstrated a technique that I called the Finchley graft. And I got a, a lot of comments and some questions about it that I wanted to address here, but I want to address it in the context of the relationship that grafting has with other knitting techniques. So I think once I walk through all of these relationships, then we can see why the Finchley graft works and also we can see a why it probably isn't going to work in other situations. So what I have here is two separate pieces of fabric. I cast on and bound off these different pieces of fabric and then I began seaming them together. What I have here is one piece of fabric where I knit most of it in blue and then halfway through knitting it, I switched to one row of yellow and I have a piece of blue seaming yarn attached that is partially covering up the yellow stitches using um, a technique called duplicate stitch. And then right here, what I have are two pieces of fabric that each have live stitches and I have partially joined them, those two sets of live stitches together with this yellow yarn. And this is an exaggerated graft because these stitches are much larger than they would normally be. But so part of this swatch has been grafted and part of it is still live on the needles. So let's go through these different processes and, and look at how they're related to each other. This is two separate pieces of fabric and I'm joining them with a seam and I'm using a process called mattress stitch that can be used to join various different kinds of edges. And in this case, I'm joining two horizontal edges. And th the idea here is that you are creating the join in a way that matches the path of the stitches. So you're sort of replicating what the stitches look like across from each other. Here I have the V of a stitch on this upper edge and I bring the needle down between the two stitches and then come around from behind. And then on this edge of the fabric, I'm going down through the center of a stitch and then coming up through the center of the next stitch. So again, you're grabbing two loops of yarn, but they're uh, on this edge, it's in the center of the two stitches and here it's around both legs of the stitch instead. And when you do that, you create something that basically looks like another stitch. It's much more enlarged. And then every so often you tighten the yarn and the edge close up and you don't see the seaming yarn. And then the two edges come right together. And so you, there is a seam ditch right here, but you can see that the that the columns of stitches are continuous. So that's, that's this technique that we use when we're seaming. So what I have here is a single swatch where I worked a single row in yellow just to, to identify a particular row. So on this side of the fabric, you see these individual little Vs of the knitting. And if you turn it upside down, you still see the Vs. It looks the same right side up and upside down, you're not seeing the same legs of, of stitches creating this V as you are seeing creating this one. They're kind of offset from each other. But the effect is that the fabric looks the same right side up or upside down. And I can follow the path of this row of stitches using that same technique I used for seaming. I'm coming around behind one stitch, both legs of one stitch. And then I come down through the center of this stitch and up through the center of this stitch. So in both cases, from the top of the fabric, I'm going 
down and then up. So kind of creating a, a, a U shape around to go around those stitches. And then I come across here and I'm going down and up again. So I'm using that same motion. It's just up here, I'm coming around both legs of one of the Vs. And here I'm going down through the center of a V and up through the center of the V next to it. So when you do this, you can cover up those stitches. So this is a technique called duplicate stitch and it's often used as an embroidery technique to create little um, contrast color shapes or if you're doing something in a uh, color work pattern using intarsia but you have tiny little areas where you need to do the eyes of, a, of an animal or something like that, you can do these little bits uh, in duplicate stitch. Now this is also a technique that's known as Swiss darning which is used or was used in the in the era when people would darn their socks when they would have a thin spot somewhere that hadn't broken into a hole but had a thin spot and they would just trace the stitches that existed already using this technique in order to reinforce it. Now what happens if you go on the other side of the fabric? Well here you can see that the stitches don't look the same. You can still pull the fabric apart and see the path of, of the stitches in here. Well, on this side of the fabric, this is, uh, you can use this same idea of following the path of the stitches by going through the purl bumps on this side. And as you do that, you'd be covering up these yellow ones, but you're not doing anything on the other face of the fabric. You're just covering them up here. But this is a really great way of weaving in yarn tails because you're following the same path of the stitches as the knitting, which means that you can cut the yarn tail very close to the surface. And then the yarn tail is going to stretch along with the fabric. So now what we have here are two pieces of fabric, again, that we're joining, but this time, the two pieces of fabric have live stitches and we're joining using a graft. Now this kind of image is very similar to what you would see in a knitting reference book. The, when they're showing you how to graft and they're showing you how the path of the grafting yarn goes through all the stitches. So the, they might have the needles in, uh, in the stitches still or they might have them sort of pulled partially way out and these loops are are lying flat so that you can really see what's going on. But that isn't the actual reality of the way we tend to graft, especially when we are grafting sock toes. And that's because sock toes are knit in the round and you have a very small number of stitches. There's no way to make the sock toe lie flat like this. You could put something up inside of it, like a darning egg, something that could spread those stitches apart so that you could get something that looked like this. But in most cases, when you are grafting a sock toe, you are not seeing the fabric in this perspective. You're seeing it with the two pieces of fabric with the wrong sides facing each other. You can only see one face of the fabric. You can't see the other face and you're working from a very different perspective. You can't really see what's going on. But what is going on is the same process that we have seen with the Swiss darning or the duplicate stitch or even the seaming. And that is when we come across this way, across, across, we're coming down through the center of one stitch and then up through the center of the other. And then when we come over to this side, we're going down through the center of that stitch and up through the center of the next one that stays on the needles. And so we're creating that same path. We're going down and up and then across from here and down and up. But when we're in the position of doing Kitchener stitch, live stitches off the needles, the needles are held in your hand like this and the two pieces of fabric are held against each other and you can't even see where you are on the back side. And so then we get these steps uh, that we have to memorize. You're knitting off and purling on, the back you're purling off and knitting on. So we have these sets of steps that you have to remember that don't seem like they have any relationship between what you see in a reference book when it's lying like this. Now some people 
understand that relationship. Oh, this is this is what you're doing. It's the same thing as seaming or duplicate stitch. Their brains have enough spatial flexibility that they can translate what's going on when it's flat to what's going on when it's hanging down like this. And I do not have that spatial flexibility. I had to learn Kitchener stitch and what to look for and how to remember how to do it in a very different way than what I see when I'm doing it in this perspective. So the way the Finchley graft is, is that you, you just are going directly across back and forth like this. You come back in this direction like this. And what does this look like? This business of coming back and forth, back and forth. It looks just like reverse duplicate stitch. Just the fact that you keep on the surface of the fabric while you're working reverse duplicate stitch allows you to to maintain that sort of same set of movements when the fabric is hanging from the needles like this. So the Finchley graft is very specific to being worked in stockinette fabric from the purl side because what you're doing is essentially the same movements that you would do if you were working in reverse duplicate stitch. You're, you're entering the stitches in the same way and just because of, of how everything is positioned relative to each other, when you change this fabric from being flat to hanging, what you're doing doesn't really change. Unlike what happens when you're doing it from this perspective and you, instead of scooping down both uh, from both sides of the fabric in the same way when they're lying flat, you have to really change what you're doing when it's hanging this way. For every stitch pattern, the yarn has a unique path as it moves across the row. The Finchley graft works on the purl side of stockinette because the yarn needle replicates the duplicate stitch path regardless of whether the fabric lies flat on a horizontal surface or hangs vertically from the needles. For other stitch patterns, the yarn needle has a more complex path, so the Finchley method won't work. Even if you understand the path the yarn needle takes when the fabric lies flat, you may have difficulty with the mental gymnastics required to translate that when the fabric hangs vertically from the needles. I use different grafting and joining methods depending on the specific combination of stitch pattern and the direction in which the two fabric edges were knitted relative to the graft. If I'm grafting the cast on end to the bind off end of the same piece of fabric and it was worked in a stitch pattern other than stockinette or garter stitch, then I can graft the fabric with no disruption to the stitch pattern and the edges will be even. The method I use for that is a variation of Lucy Neatby's toe chimney method of grafting, which does not require working with live stitches. If I'm grafting the bind off ends of two pieces of fabric or two halves of the same row around and the fabric was worked in a stitch pattern, I don't even try to graft because there will be a half stitch offset in the stitch pattern and at the edges. Instead, I use a three needle bind off that will match up the columns of stitches and the edges. I have an entire playlist of grafting techniques and another of seaming techniques you might be interested in. Plus, you can click on that information symbol at the top of the screen for all the videos I link to throughout this video. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.